Mm. Do you hear that? Mm, it's coffee. Welcome to another video. It is that time for September wrapping up of everything I read in September, which is how this works. So I'm going to be taking you guys along through every single book I read in September, which is actually a lot. I didn't realize how much I'd read this month, but um, I got through 11 books and we actually had quite a few winners, a few losers. That's okay. But I'm actually really excited to uh, speak about a couple of these because I found like a new favorite book of all time. I found some really funny books I just want to go on rants about, so I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the channel. My name is Emma if you're new here. I just want to start with like the book that was my favorite, so that is what we shall do. This is this is a hands down my favorite book of the month, one of my favorite books of the year, one of my favorite books of all time now, and this right here, everyone, this is the Iliac Crest. The Iliac Crest by Christina Rivera Garza. Wow. Translated by Sarah Booker. Fantastic. Just absolutely wonderful. I cannot wait to film a whole video about this book, like a little essay or lecture or something, because this book is just mind-blowing. It is fantastic. It deals with a variety of different topics that the discussion of these topics, this book required so much work for me. I'm so glad I kept track of all the topics and like discussion um, that goes on in here. So essentially what I want to tell you about this book is the reason why I bought it because the premise sounded super interesting. So we have this unnamed narrator staying in their house. I'll tell you a little bit more than the synopsis. So our unnamed protagonist works at a hospital kind of at the end of the world almost it feels like where essentially they help those who basically come to this hospital to die. Like once they enter this hospital, they're not getting out alive. They basically come there to perish. And so one night, one dark and stormy night, the best things start on the dark and stormy nights, two people knock on this person's door. One is an ex-lover or an ex-girlfriend or something like that. Someone that they've been in a relationship with. And the other person is someone who is claiming to be the famous Mexican writer, um, Amparo de Vila. As these two people basically barge into our protagonist's house and kind of start to take things over, they kind of begin this mission to convince him or to let him know or to tell him or to make him convince that they know his secret. Um, and I want to use like all these pronouns so carefully because they are trying to convince him that he is actually a woman um, and that they know his secret. This book is just phenomenal. It deals with so much about gender. Um, the Iliac Crest, the reason why it's called the Iliac Crest is because that's kind of the bone in our anatomy that women have that is the most easily distinguishable piece of anatomy when you are identifying a skeleton or the remains of someone to identify their gender is the iliac crest but more than that this book is about specifically like language how much language is gendered the use of gendered language how this using language that is already so affected by our perceptions of gender and how you use it to describe yourself the others the world affects your own perceptions of yourself the own performance of yourself it was just fantastic couple this with this huge discussion of borders um, in the preface the author says that she's lived most of her life along the U.S. Mexican border um, and in this age of like hugely vast occurring numbers of femicides that occur specifically along this border of U.S. and Mexico a lot of that was worked into this book as well so you can imagine there's already so many borders between our protagonists working at this hospital where there is so little distinguishing these people who are still alive sleeping in these sick beds from the death that they will super soon sink into and how he doesn't really care for them anymore, right? Like it's this really deep, disturbing scene of this hospital where the caretakers and the nurses and the doctors really abuse their patients because they know they know they're just there to die. But this novel also discusses so many more boundaries than that. It is also a huge call to um, revitalize, rejuvenate, and essentially bring back Davila's writing, who is a Mexican writer who has pretty much been wiped from existence because a lot of this book as well deals with disappearance and the disappeared. And obviously Davila, you know, she wasn't kidnapped, she never went missing. Um, she's dead now, but her writing has essentially been disappeared. And if you disappear someone's writing, if you disappear their language and who they are and their way of looking at the world and their way of speaking the world, you essentially disappear them. And so this book is also a call via the character of Davila and a whole bunch of discussion about her writing to bring back and to essentially get rid of that disappearingness that keeps happening with a lot of these women writers in history. Um, I thought it was fantastic for an excruciatingly short book. I wanted this book to go on for forever. Five stars. It was uh, like 
breathtaking. I cannot stop. I cannot stop thinking about it. The characters in here are just crazy. I love how this book just leaves you absolutely falling through the sky um, because our protagonist is in this moment of crisis where he or she or they doesn't know anymore who they are. Um, and it's just incredible. This book is so devastating in so many different ways. It's so hard to understand sometimes. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, I cannot wait to read. I don't know if I think Christina Rivera Garza actually has another book out, which I want to order and as well. I would love to do a huge deep dive delve into the Vila because that's also the point of this book as well is to bring back um, people who have been disappeared. And one way you can do that is to read their writing again and find them. Um, so yeah, I highly, highly please highly please recommend this book. Um, it was wonderful. I could not put this down. Like, I absolutely could not put this down. It gripped me so hard. It reminded me why I love writing. It reminded me why I love writing, though, too, and reading, because I wanted to write after reading this book, and those are the best kinds of books. So if you want a challenge, if you want something devastating, if you want something spooky, hallucinatory, um, something about language, gender, disappearing, um, but also night terror and bodies and death. Um, this is the one for you. Now that we spent a good 10 minutes talking about this book, let us move on. Maybe, I don't know what I want to talk about next. Let's talk about something a little bit lighter, but something that I also loved tremendously much, and that is a young adult romance from Little Tokyo with Love by Sarah Kuhn. Ah, I, yeah, I just feel so much love in my heart from Little Tokyo with Love. Like, it was wonderful. I had been struggling for a while to find a contemporary romance and also a young adult romance that I loved. I kept DNFing and DNFing and DNFing and then I saw this one just hanging out on Libby. It was kind of just, you know, in the new tags. I believe this is a fairly recent release and it sounded really cute and so I picked it up and this one kind of took me a little bit to get into and get past that really like, do you know what I'm talking about? The kind of trite extraness that authors seem to think that young people talk. I think you know what I'm saying, like young women, young teenagers, young girls, young anyone, they don't actually talk in hashtags and I think someone needs to tell authors that. Regardless, once I got past that, I actually really started to enjoy the story. So from Little Tokyo with Love is about this girl named Rika and she is living in Little Tokyo with her two aunts and her two cousins. There are so many different characters in this book and you get to like meet them all and it's just really fun. Um, but Rika is Japanese American and because of this she's never really fit in to her community and there's actually been a lot of prejudice and the way she's been treated over the years has not been very nice at all. So this book opens during a festival in Little Tokyo and in the middle of the festival a woman runs out of a float or a car or whatever she's in and she bumps into Rika and this woman happens to be the super famous movie star Grace Kimura who then Rika and other people start to believe is actually her mother because her mother went missing when she had Rika. She also bumps into Hank Chen who is also part of kind of the Hollywood movie industry world because he is a dancer, actor, very nice man. And so together Hank and Rika basically go on this adventure, like just wonderful adventure all over Little Tokyo in the span of like a week or a few days. What I really love most about this book was just like that adventure, that ride that essentially you get to go on. I thought the romance was super cute. I thought it was really nice. There was a lot of important things discussed. Um, I loved going everywhere. It was like this tour of Little Tokyo and like you could really feel, like I literally feel like I went there in a book, which is just the best thing ever. You get to go to like the observatory, you get to go to a whole bunch of libraries and restaurants and places that probably no one really talks about that much in this book and I just really loved that aspect. I thought it was extremely cozy as well. On top of that, I just really loved how like people explored themselves in this book. I thought it was so powerful and as well explored like problems in their own life. For example, Rika deals with extreme anger issues. Hank deals with extreme anxiety. It was just really nice to like have actual conversations about these things in this book as well. Like this book talked about so much. At times it was quite serious and heavy and at times it was just so fun and lighthearted and I really just enjoyed listening to it. I loved it so much. So I gave it four stars and I was really happy that I found this one. So that is from Little Tokyo with Love. What was that? I don't know. I'm trying to eat it. Next, we're going to talk about a little bit of a disappointment. And that is Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Tashi Kazu Kawaguchi. I picked this one up um, a couple summers ago. I ordered this because I just saw so many people talking about it and it sounded great. It sounded fantastic. This is a book about a cafe where you can go back in time in this cafe. It's a book about time travel and coffee. A book like that, a book about time travel and coffee, I expect to either give one star to or like five stars. 
little did I expect to give it like three stars and just have this be like pure mediocrity. I don't know, it really bothers me. Like I don't want to read mediocre books. Why do I want to read mediocre books? There were a lot of problems with this. So first of all, okay, the good things, the premise was really cool. Um, I did think some aspects of this were quite cozy. September I thought was the perfect time to read a book about a coffee shop. Um, and I just really like coffee, so I am inherently biased. However, um, when you take those things away, like really what was this book? Not very much at all. Like very, very, very not very much. This book, I think, tried to force so much substance and emotion to the point where it ended up having zero of those things. So we essentially follow, like, I think four or five different little stories that unravel in this cafe of people traveling back to the past for various sad reasons. I feel like he just tried to get the most sobable sob stories to make you sob, but it just ended up coming off as really fake and actually quite annoying in some cases. <laughs> One thing that really really took the star rating down was the writing. I felt absolutely nothing towards it and the way that this coffee shop was explained because there are a number of explicit rules like it was repeated and repeated and repeated to death um, because you would have a character like bemoan all of these rules, then you would have the waitress explain all of the rules, then you would have the character sit down and go through all the rules again and pinpoint all of the little things concerning these rules like literally four or five times in almost each of the different stories it was just weird i don't think anyone's memory is that faulty like <laughs> i don't think there was any need to like really ram down these rules of the cafe a billion bajillion times so that was quite annoying and then on top of that like i said like the writing of the different stories and why people are going back into the past i did not find compelling at all there's people who go back to try and reconcile with um, someone they've broken up with. There's people who go back to see their husband who's been suffering with Alzheimer's for a long time. There's people who go back to see a dead family member, all the stuff like that. Like the saddest things you can imagine happening to you in your life, why you would want to go back and talk to someone in the cafe. But like, I just felt absolutely nothing. Didn't even feel remotely sad, remotely sympathetic or empathetic towards anything in this book. And I was like, why? Um, because these are actually really sad things that are happening, but when you present them in a book like this with the writing, the atmosphere, the style, um, and just the way that he did it, it like came across as like just very commercial sadness, does that make sense? And sadness that has been commercialized is just inherently drained of any qualities that I want to connect with, because when you commercialize something, I think you lose that connection. Um, just my opinion, I've seen a lot of lukewarm reviews about this though, so I know a lot of people feel the same way. Really disappointed in this actually, and I gave it a generous three stars, but in the end I was actually just bored, so unfortunate. I will not be reading any more of the stories in here because I think there's like a sequel or something like that, but um, that is before the coffee gets cold. Oh, I have upset the book gods. I just spilled my coffee everywhere right after I put that down. Listen, I take it back. I'm sorry. I really did just spill coffee all over my sweater and desk. Sorry. I'm just gonna keep going on. So the next one I read was the young adult fantasy. I started school in September. I went back to university and I just found myself immediately in the mood to read hot trash. I like reading anything and everything. If something's on a syllabus and I have to read it, I'm like, great, I'll read it. But in that, there is still a small measure of your will, <laughs> your free will being taken away because then you, you know, there's you are prescribed stuff to read. And when I'm prescribed stuff like Beowulf and Renaissance literature and old English literature, my mind immediately wants trash. It immediately wants garbage. It's like when you're taken to a really expensive restaurant and you are served a plate with like the tiniest morsel of artisanal bologna that they can serve you. And then you immediately go out afterwards and like buy McDonald's or something. Um, that's kind of what it was. Anyway, so you'll notice a lot of these are like very either like, oh yes, literature or <laughs> literature. Can we delete that? Can I cut that out? So on that note, I read Fireblood by Ellie Blake. Um, this is a young adult fantasy and I actually really like this series. Like I just love it. Um, this is the second book and in this world there are Firebloods and there are Frostbloods. Yes, people who can tss, work frost and work fire and that's it some people are born with this ability some people just don't get it at all sucks for them there's also of course wars because the frost bloods and fire bloods 
are fighting. I love the first book. I gave it four stars. We're following Ruby, who <laughs> is a fireblood, and she essentially gets taken captive by the evil Frost King, and she has to do this Hunger Games-esque battle in his court against different Frostbloods, and I just really liked it. I thought the characters were amazing. I really like Ellie Blake's writing, actually. Like, she takes every single young adult fantasy trope that's been overdone to the point of being deceased, dead, flat on the ground, and she somehow revives them and makes them cool. And I'm like, I love this. Even though I've read this a thousand times, Ellie Blake makes it feel very comforting. I love her metaphors. I love her similes. <laughs> her similes. I love what she does with language. I love her characters. I really feel like I connect to them. Ruby can be a bit annoying at times, but I love the romance in here. The banter. We love, we love good banter. This book was filled with good banter. Oh, it was just great. There's like an enemies to lovers kind of arc and Fireblood actually introduced another character with another enemies to lovers arc and it worked again. I liked Fireblood significantly less just because um, I thought it lost a little bit of focus. It was a little bit like too much was going on. Um, we were taken to a whole other place and this one just felt a little bit too simple, but I did really like it and I gave it three stars and I will definitely be finishing off this trilogy. So off to a good start. Then uh, just giving you whiplash in this video, left, right, and center, I guess. We are going to flip to some university works that I had to read. So the first one was Utopia by Thomas More, Sir Thomas More. This was written in uh, 1515, I believe, and this is essentially like one of the first pieces of utopian literature where Thomas More describes the perfect society, but it's actually quite like a dialogue of different things and of moving parts and pieces that happen in the society um, before we get to the place called Utopia, the place where Thomas More is describing this perfect society is actually called Utopia. Um, there's quite a bit before that that discusses a lot of philosophy um, in terms of how do you advise those in power? How do you do it in a way to actually affect change rather than just get yourself beheaded, get your head on a spike, which does happen to Sir Thomas More, so I guess he didn't learn his lesson. That was really interesting, I really did like that, and there's like a really cool discussion there um, about like philosophers and kings and their relationship, but then we go into Utopia proper, which is literally just one of the characters describing every single aspect of Utopian society from um, their government to their military to their moneyless economy um, to the clothes they wear, what they eat. It is definitely a very communal like commonwealth and that utopia really does work for the common well-being of everyone. Everyone's kind of treated the same, given the same clothes to eat, they have to do the same things. It's quite communist in a lot of its values, which is cool, um, but there are a lot of problems at the heart of utopian society. That was interesting, like picking out those problems, discussing them. I really did not like reading this book. I think it's interesting to see what someone living under King Henry VIII in the 1500s thinks like you know some ideas could be implemented into the court to have a better commonwealth in england um but reading it now i'm like well that doesn't work that's not gonna work that's kind of rubbish that's wrong um i would never do that i would never want to live here this isn't uh, very utopian at all actually um, which is cool thinking about, but just the the actual physical experience of reading this book is a bit torturous, it's quite long, it's quite dry, it's honestly really boring, so I gave it two stars, um, and that is Utopia. All right, swinging it back around, not to trash, this was not trash, this was just pure serotonin, um, that is Call Me Can't Communicate, Volume 1 by Tomohito Oda. I love this, I've been waiting to read this for so long, uh, I first heard about this on booktube during the pandemic, and I bought it, and now I have it and now I've read it and I love it. Someone commented on one of my last videos, I think, that they are making Comey Can't Communicate into an anime series, which I am gonna watch the ever-loving poop out of. Essentially, this one is about Comey. She is a high school student and everyone thinks she is so popular, so beautiful, so aloof. She's too cool for school, but in reality, she just has crippling social anxiety. She has super, super bad anxiety. Um, but her goal is to make 100 friends. However, that's really hard for her because she can't even bring herself to physically speak to another human being. So when she finds herself alone in a classroom with a similar wallflower who's quite shy like her, but not to the point of her paralysis, um, his name is Tadano and she writes on the chalkboard, I wanna make 100 friends. And then they start to communicate on the chalkboard. 
um, through text messages, through sticky notes. It is so wholesome, so sweet. Through Comey, like Tadano starts to break out of his own shell to make Comey friends himself, and in doing so, he also makes friends. Um, they become best friends, and it's just really, really sweet. So in volume one, you follow her on her quest to, I think she makes like two or three friends in this one. I really liked it. I thought it was really funny really sweet, really freaking wholesome, just pure wholesomeness. It captures perfectly the unparalleled anxiety of walking into Starbucks and like the pep talks you need to give yourself before you enter that domain. It was amazing. I loved it. I gave it four stars. Then I read another one, which was a little bit of a disappointment actually. And this is super weird to me because this is one that is like so beloved in everyone's hearts. And I'm, I really am sorry about this one because it is Pan's Labyrinth. Um, they made a book out of this, written in turn by Guillermo del Toro and as well Cornelia Funk. Um, I've always wanted to watch the movie. I've never seen the movie, so I thought I should, I don't know, I thought I would start with the book. I think this one was a bit, ru not ruined for me, but definitely was a disappointment because I had like this idea that Pan's Labyrinth was a lot going to be kind of more of a fantasy than it was and that we would be in the labyrinth for most of the story, which is totally not the case, at least not in the book. So in this one, we follow a young girl named Ophelia, and she is going with her mother to live with her mother's new husband, who is this awful, awful man working for the fascists in Spain at the time. Kind of like along the way of her being in this house, being so upset, being treated awfully, it's clear that the wolf, as they call him, doesn't really want her mother at all. He just wants a son out of her so he can have an heir. She finds herself being escorted into the labyrinth one night, which is this like, you know, mythical, fantastical place where the people there convince her that she is actually the long lost princess of the kingdom. Um, but actually most of this book is not really about that at all. Um, it's about what's happening at the wolf's household. Um, the rebel soldiers in the fields, outside the political climate it's quite a violent book a lot of it actually ended up being really repetitive to me because we just seem to be doing the same things like trying to sneak out of the wolf's house and like thwart his plans stab knives into his guards and we didn't actually get a lot of the magicalness that i wanted like i have a feeling this works a lot better as a film as a book it really did not pull it off for me at all. I was actually quite let down, so I gave it three stars because I thought the premise was cool. I just thought as a novel, perhaps this did not work as well as they wanted it to, but I will definitely have more thoughts to say when I actually watch the movie, if I can find it anywhere. So if anyone has read this and they've watched the movie, please let me know how it compares because I was just left feeling a little bit like the glitter didn't really get the glitter on me from like this cultural phenomenon that everyone loves. So that is Pan's Labyrinth. All right, also for uni, I read Beowulf. Um, this is a reread for me. I actually liked it better the second time around, which was amazing. I really actually liked it better this time. So Beowulf is an old English epic uh, from the Anglo-Saxon period, and we follow the Viking hero Beowulf, um, who goes over to the Geats or the Danes, and he is there to slay the monster Grendel, who is absolutely ravaging, ravishing, eating, um, dismembering, gorging himself on, absolutely slaughtering, <laughs> why did I go on for so long, um, the men of Hrothgar's hall, and Hrothgar is like, you know, the other Viking dude, um, so Beowulf gets there, he's like, yo, I have a big sword, I'm gonna absolutely get rid of this monster for you, and he does, um, we also have Grendel's mother, who is another ghostly, beastly, spooky creature, Grendel and his mother and the other monsters kind of nearby, I guess, are descendants of Cain um, from the Bible, and it was just really cool. Like, really the parts with Beowulf alone I have no interest in, but thankfully what we mostly focused on in class are Grendel and Grendel's mom, um, who are so fascinating, so cool. And yeah, I did not read the translation by Michael Alexander. I read Seamus Heaney, which is a much better translation if you're wanting to pick up Beowulf, but really accessible, really wonderful. Seamus Heaney's alliteration is to simply die for. And I, like I said, I enjoyed it so much more this time. Like I really loved thinking about it and just, I love Grendel. I really love Grendel. I would love to read Grendel by John Gardner. So that is Beowulf. And I don't know if I'm going to write my essay on this because I have to pick oh, like what work I'm going to choose. But if it's Beowulf, I guess we'll be talking about this a lot more in my study vlogs, but I don't know yet. So yeah, but that's good. I really, really recommend this. Then I picked up Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. 
This is definitely one of the more devastating books that I read this month. This is, I think, a 2021 release as well. I also saw this on Libby. I haven't heard too many people talk about this yet, but this is a really impressive work about Colombia and about family and about um, living as an undocumented person in the United States. So essentially this book opens and we are following a girl who is running away from this like, it's kind of like a juvenile detention center on top of a mountain in Colombia and she's trying to get back home to her father because her father has a plane ticket for her to leave to America to be with her mom and her brothers and sisters who are over in America. Um, and so you kind of start already being a little bit fragmented. Um, and torn into and like trying to get somewhere in a certain amount of time um, But you also know that you're gonna be leaving someone you love behind kind of on the other side And that's really what this book is about this book goes back and forth and back and forth from Colombia to the US um, It's also a family saga. It follows a bunch of generations of this family. We go from Bogota to I think I don't know where they're staying Chicago somewhere in the US um, and we see how our protagonist family like got to where it is today so a lot of this story actually focuses on her mother and father who were from Bogota and then they got a visa to go to the US um, however once they were there and you know they're trying to build a life for themselves and back money to their family still living in Colombia um, but then you see how easy it was for them to kind of get sucked into America how hard it was for them to leave even after their visa expired and so what they decide to do is stay in America um, living undocumented and so just like oh just like the idea of the infinite country something that you can never leave behind even if you actually go over the boundary line or if you leave the border of that country it is still on you it is still you it goes on forever it goes past the boundary where it said it ended and where it said it finished and to see the consequences of that is just devastating especially when like going from Colombia to the US a lot of those people in the US look on that idea of the infinite country as this negative thing because they don't want them there they want to send them back and that is ultimately what ends up happening is that you have this like transferal over and over and over again of people crossing over getting sent back escaping back over having to go back you have someone who dies in colombia and their remains are sent to the u.s to be with their family it's just this like ever lasting exchange between one country to the other and it was so horrifying to see like that effect um on families and on people who just are trying to live their lives and get by and it was really really well done it was such an impressive work of literary fiction because like it didn't it wasn't a work where like it just wanted to like shove the theory and the literariness like down your throat it was very much a really easily followed story that focused like 95 percent of the time on the actual people in these situations what they're going through their thoughts their feelings you get an intimate look into everything they're facing in their lives but it still managed to be this beautifully done dissection and this tragic look into the effects of what is actually going on in the world i believe um this goes all the way up kind of until 2016 so yeah really loved it i gave it four stars so impressed and i would really love to read more from patricia angle so would highly recommend this as well um yeah it was just it was amazing the dark academics book pick for the couple of months that we read it was maurice by ian e. forster this was carolyn's pick and next month is actually my pick um which i will uh where is it I'll show you it at the end of this video, but we did make our announcement in the live show and there'll be a post too. So anyway, we read Maurice by E.M. Forster. Uh, this was my first Forster. I really liked it. Not as much as I was expecting to actually. So Maurice follows a young man. This was published after E.M. Forster's death in 1970. He didn't want to publish it during his lifetime since it is about stuff that he himself is going through, has gone through. Um, unfortunately, and so it is about Maurice who goes to Cambridge University and discovers that he is homosexual um, And what happens to him after he learns this by kind of falling in love with a classmate named Clive from Cambridge We basically follow him for a number of years. Um, we follow his relationship with Clive the devastating effects when all of a sudden Clive takes a trip to Greece. Forster's, what I found about like Forster's writing style, it was really distinct. I feel like if I read any piece of writing, you could definitely pick him out from a bunch. It's quite, like he has a unique kind of flavor to him, I think. I don't know if I completely love it, but I like that he has a unique flavor. It's very like simple, blunt, 
writing um, and I found a lot of the context sometimes to be hard to distinguish especially because it's like from this very specific Cambridge Edwardian British place and I was like wait what are we actually saying on the whole I really like this and I would recommend so that is Maurice oh we have to end off with this one I'm sorry I'm sorry everyone so we have some more hot trash and this one isn't oh no this one isn't hot is hot trash a compliment it's not hot trash it's like cold garbage yeah yeah this book is cold garbage um that is music of the nights by Angela J Ford um okay here it is here it is. Um, I guess you can guess why I picked this up. This is a fantasy romance retelling. Uh, oh god, n retelling? Let's not, let's not use that word so liberally. A Phantom of the Opera. I heard about this because one of you guys actually screamed it into my DMs and I was like, thank you so much. So I actually bought this book at the beginning of the year and I tried to pick it up in March um, and it was actually so bad that I had to put it down until a later date when my standards were lowered as such. My standards have been lowered and so I picked it back up. Wasn't any better though. Like I went on Goodreads after I finished this and I saw like five star after five star after five star reviews. And I'm like, did we even read the same book? I don't know what those people on Goodreads are talking about. Forgiving the typos, the spelling errors, the grammar, the fact that the author doesn't seem to know how to string a sentence together. Uh, the plot was simply unforgivable. The characters were paper loving phantom of the opera as much as i do i think this was laughable if not making me want to cry at how bad it was and just that it wanted to be associated with the masterpiece in my opinion <laughs> that is larue's novel um i didn't even think the smut was that good like the smut was honestly kind of bad and i was like well what was the point of you what was the point of you? The cover is gorgeous and that's it. In this one, if we just want to talk about it for a little bit, I guess we follow a girl named Arya and she is- Okay, first of all, when you have a castle in a fantasy world and you decide to call your castle High Tower Castle, right, so levels of creativity. A castle has high towers? like calling my dog fluffy tail she is staying in hightower castle um with her uncle her uncle like saved her off of the streets because her family died and now she has to dance in his theater troupe to i guess pay him back for staying at his castle um but one night she starts to hear music from hightower which is a different thing than hightower castle it's actually just a tower uh just one singular tower across the way where it's said to be haunted by a spirit, but one night she goes there because she's like, you know what? The spirit's got a good voice and I want to learn how to sing. And so she climbs the tower and finds Uriah. It was quite confusing having like Arya and Uriah as the main characters. But anyway, he is a man who has been living up in a tower all alone um, singing and like his singing can create magic and do some cool things. Yeah, it was just really, really bad. I gave it two stars. I did have some like fun times cackling at how bad it was, so that's why it doesn't get the full one star for me. I don't know, it just, I get a little jaded when like this gets published and you know, I buy it, but when I buy a published book, like I expect, I expect sentences to be fully written. I expect you to know how to spell words. I don't know, I just think the writing is honestly appalling. It was so awkward, it did not capture the human <laughs> at all. It's like, I feel like Angela J. Ford has never met a human in her life. Like, they do not speak like this, they don't sound like this. Um, the placement of words, the grammar, the sentences, the syntax, the context, the content, like, nothing, nothing, nothing good. Like, how do you, how do you get, how does this get published? I'm not being mean at all, I think I'm just being honest. Like, this is just... It's just awful. It's just really awful. But if anyone has any other Phantom of the Opera retellings, fantasy romance or not, um, I am totally open to trying them. But that is, that is that. Oh, it feels so bad. Sorry we had to end on that note. Um, but I'm gonna clean up my coffee now. I had a really good reading month and I'm so excited to plan October's very spooky tbr so let me know like as usual what your favorite book of the month was i love reading all your comments i love being nosy and seeing what you loved and hated and read and recommend so thank you much thank you thank you much so for watching
Yes, thank you much so for watching. I will see you very soon with a very spooky special TBR. Um, oh no, the Dark Academics book pick I picked for October and November is Thus Were Their Faces by Silvina Ocampo. So yeah, I'm very excited about that. I hope you join us to read that one. It's a collection of like her work, some short stories, some not, I think. So anyway, that is that. And until next time, ciao.